Bugle sound taps. circle representing the golden ratio. Uh, the golden ratio is this fascinating, some of the greatest mathematician minds of all ages. Um, from Pythagoras to Euclid um, in ancient Greece, through the medieval Italian mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, uh, and the Renaissance, Renaissance astronomer um, Kepler. It's been used in architecture in everything from the Parthenon to the modern international style of uh, Le Corbusier. Um, but the fascination with the golden ratio is not not confined to just mathematics. Um, biologists, artists, musicians, historians, architects, um, psychologists, and even mystics have pondered and debated the basis of the ubiquity and the appeal. Um, so the bottom tier here that we see, the largest tier, um, uh, it represents the community, it represents all of us. Uh, in our cultural, culture of rugged individualism, we dance around the word community. We apply it to almost any uh, collection of individuals, a town, a church, um, a fraternal organization, an apartment complex, um, a professional association. Um, regardless of how poorly uh, those individuals communicate with each other, it's a false use of the word. Uh, we're going to use the word meaningfully. We must restrict it to, to a group of individuals that learn how to communicate honestly with each other, whose relationships go deeper than their mass of composure, and who have developed some uh, significant commitment uh, to celebrate together, uh, mourn together, and to delight in each other, uh, make others' uh, conditions our own, and, uh, and who can uh, continuously come together for one purpose. But what then does such a rare group look like? Let's look around today. Um, the three steps here that I'm standing on, these are the three parts of the Scout Oath. This is what they stand for. Um, we step up to the middle tier. The middle tier stands for the mentor. Um, it stands for the Scout Master. It stands for the teacher, the parent, the staff member. The simple guy that one day, way back when, gave some good advice. Um, in this circle, we honor and remember those people who have made a difference in our life, uh, no matter how small. Uh, these are the people who dedicated their time to pushing young men and women to accomplish their goals, as well as use their full potential. Um, the 12 steps behind me, which is this platform and above, uh, these stand for the, the, the 12 words in, in the Scout Law. Uh, for more than a century, every scout has pledged on his honor, 
to do his duty to his country. Each scout residing in the scout law was promised to be loyal, helpful, obedient, and brave. The words come easily, but what does it really mean when a scout stands here and salutes this flag? Uh, this top tier, this top tier represents just that. It gives us all time to think about what it means to be Americans and to pledge ourselves to make it our country the best it can be. I'll wrap this up with the American creed. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, whose just powers are derived from the constant of the government, of the government, sorry, um, a democracy in a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union. One and inseparable, established upon those principles from freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrificed their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Next, we have the uh, dedication of the wall, uh, Mr. Dick Sylvia. Come on up, please. This wasn't very easy. Um, when you do something like this, you're supposed to come up with some words that encompass the feeling of all the alumni and the feeling of. of the relatives and friends of those people that we put on the wall. Before I dedicate it again, I'd like to thank everyone that gave their time, their money, and their encouragement in making this possible. When I look at the wall, I see 10 names in the class. Each name is a story unto itself. We have a theater owner that invested his money to aid summer camps. We have a utility company. We have a plumber. We have a carpenter. We have an educator. We have an all-around utility man. We have a retired firefighter. We have a professional scouter, a professional ranger, and a professional soldier. Of the 10 names, Six were awarded the Silver Viva, the highest award a council can bestow. Three were professionals in the Boy Scouts of America. One was a professional that became a respected volunteer. Although all ten have different stories, all ten share one important link, cash flow. Each one of the names honored on this wall supported not only the summer camp program, but the short-term use such as camperies, weekend camping by all units. All were at one time or another staff members at Cash Lab, and yet each one went beyond their role in scouting to support and promote this place we know so well. This wall represents not only the history of Cash Lab, but also its future. As we visit and utilize it in the future, let it become not just a place of reflection, but a place of inspiration to others to follow. So in closing, we, the Camp Cashla Alumni Association, dedicate this wall of fame to those that blaze the Cashla Trail for others to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with uh, this year's inductees. So we'll have Mr. Guatemarsh to come up first for first Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Before I read this, I want to read this citation. Uh, I want to. I'm very honored to be here today 
to read the citation on that uh, But I don't feel deserving to present the plaque. I believe that uh, Brenda Pondrick deserves that. And I'm going to ask her to step forward over here and hold on to this plaque. Brenda um, was, to me, Jack's right hand. She participated in coveries with him, powwows, round tables, Klondikes, Pac-55, sub training events, and so forth. Linda, you want to come up here, please? <laughs> Hold on to that. Who is this? John Jack Byrne, a retired Boston firefighter, was known by all as the face of the Cubbery at Cashelot and one of the strongest advocates for Cub Scouting and for getting Cubs to camp in the Moby Dick Council. Jack led the planning, promotion, and execution of the Cubbery for many years and was a strong advisor to, to the Cub Day Camp leadership at Cashelot. He also worked more directly with youth in his role as assistant club master and then, and then club master of Pac-55 in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, as well as serving on the commissioner and powwow staffs. Innumerable, innumerable cubs will remember Jack either handing out blue ribbons to the winners of the day's events or getting up at a campfire with a spirited presentation of perfect prepared. An avid Amateur videographer, Jack recorded many events for the council and for the scouts it served, many of which provide valuable documentation to the association's effort to record the history of the camps and council. Jack firmly believed that Cubs should spend time outdoors at Cash Lot, and his tireless efforts ensured that hundreds, if not thousands, of Cubs did. He was also a frequent volunteer at camp, spending countless hours helping to maintain and repair the program materials and facilities for all of the scouts who enjoyed the use of cash lot. Scouting was a family affair, and Jack's son and grandsons were active in scouting as well. During his tenure, Jack, <coughs> Jack was recognized with the Silver Beaver, the District Award of Merit, and the Vigil Honor of the Art of the Arrow. As a Boston firefighter, he was the recipient of an award for heroism for his many contributions to the scouting program at Cash Lot and for a stellar example of enthusiastic service. Jack Curran merits a spot in the Wall of Fame. Tony's here, Annette, I found I, I got the name wrong initially. <laughs> I haven't seen her in years. Donna's here, sitting over there, his daughter. Uh, Mike Joseph, uh, his grandson's here. I recognize all of them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you got a lot of, a lot of relatives and family. Fantastic. The only thing that, that I find missing a lot when I come into this camp is uh, not hearing that brown band coming down the road with that crazy horn of his. <laughs> that I miss. But we'll always remember him. And at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Brenda and Linda to make the presentation to them. To the family.
it's an honor to make this presentation for Roland. And Roland can't be here, but he is living, and I'd like to ask Vic Sylvia to explain what's going to happen. Because of the vetting process that we have in inducting people onto the Wall of Fame, it really doesn't give us a lot of time to contact a uh, person, a living relatives, and get him here. Roland uh, retired from military service, and he's living in the Falls Church area of Washington, D.C. Uh, both Dennis and I were in communications with uh, uh, Roland himself. He's 92 or 94. Uh, he's still got a great memory. Uh, we've talked to his son. They tried. But apparently Roland's wife still is not feeling quite well, so they did not want to make the trip. So what we've done is uh, we have a member of our association, a gentleman by the name of Todd Van Camfort. He's the director of interagency coordination for the Department of Homeland Security. He, he retired military. He works for the director of Homeland Security. He said he would represent us in uh, meeting Roland at his home in Fall Church, Virginia and making an official presentation to him. So there will be no one here to receive the plaque, but by God, we will be there to give it to him. Yes. It's an honor for me to be in this position at this time. I was here when he was here. I was on the first camp staff and there a couple of other people that are standing here. There aren't many of us. And uh, we arrived the day before camp opened. I think it was a day before, maybe two. And we had uh, everything that we needed in a pinwheel, war surplus, military truck, and a fourth wooden station wagon. <laughs> we got lost trying to find the camp. The kids were coming in a day or two. <laughs> but we found it. There were no clearings except that clearing over there behind the beach. There was no signs of civilization except the pipe somebody had put in the ground so we could attach a hand pump to get that water supply for the summer. Uh, can you imagine what it would have been to be the director of a camp like that? And, uh, and he did it. He did it. Uh, and uh, he had come from the Air Force where he was a scouting. And in fact, in the air. Uh, I'd like to read to you a letter that he sent around 1962, I think, to the council. Uh, some inquiries were made about it. In October 1945, I was separated from the service and was appointed assistant scout executive to Richard Mulvey, then scout executive. The first priority was to find a camp for the coming summer season. During the war years, the council had been using the boys, boys club camp, which would not be available for the 46th camp of the season. A search committee was appointed by Francis Quinn, the council president. This committee was made up of some executive board members, Cranberry Broad, Robert B. John A. Peace, then president of Ocean Spray. Some interested individuals in Graham and the now standard State Forest Ranger. I tried to remember his name in my mind. It turned out that this ranger came up with the best place in the best place in information. He told us about a large tract of virgin forest with three ponds adjacent to Mount Standish. According to Mr. Makepeace, the owner of that property was Steinway, the New York piano maker. Frank Quinn, Ray Coble, Rafe Butterfield, Bill O'Rourke, and Roger Titus made the trip to New York. Mr. Steinway was reluctant to sell his property. Then he remembered how the scouts from Squanto Council Camp, 50 acres, not where it is now, were always running on his set of home property. He stated, with a thousand of acres, the cash lot scouts will never run on other people's private property. He then agreed to sell 
for the same price he paid during the Depression, $12,000. That's what this car is. The first summer, 46, we ran a work play projects camp. We took 60 scouts each week at the great cost of $6 apiece. The day was divided into work, 8 to 10, clearing brush, searching for best campsites, keeping track of temperature and when, making trails, and so forth. Afternoons were devoted to camp activities, boating, swimming, archery, baseball, volleyball, that sort of thing. Most of the equipment the first couple of years was purchased from a surplus army and Navy uh, sources. We obtained a new army 10 wheel truck for $100, a huge dining tent, uh, which was actually a hospital tent that we put up at night and you never seen what it was supposed to look like, uh, 60 by 20. Uh, a huge dining tent, which we got free, table and benches, utensils, dining trays, double bunk beds, mattresses, and so forth. Again, all free for the boss surplus. This required many trips to Newport, Quonset, and Boston, but well worth the effort. A construction team led by Ted Foster built a combination first aid administration and storage building in one day. They also sunk seven wells. During the following spring, construction crews from Foster and Al Laranja Land Construction Company on alternating Saturdays built all the tent platforms, docks, dining hall, uh, and sunk more wells and erected a quonset hut on a foundation laid by the previous week. These crews would assemble in New Bedford by 7.30, be at work at the camp by 8, leave at 6 p.m. Somebody was speeding. <laughs> the competition between uh, the Foster and the Oranger crews were amazing. The first, first question was, what did the other guys do last week? Bulldozers from the state forest made roads into and around the camp prior to the and prior prior to the first summer, but pushing out all the brush for a baseball activity speed. So that was that. It was pure sand, nothing else, just pure sand. I always will be proud of the fact that I was the first camp director and participated in the construction of Camp Cashelot for four years. Certainly not an easy assignment uh, to arrive with everything on your back, so to speak. It stopped. He did. He, he did. He uh, later went, uh, he'd been in the Air Corps, in the Air Corps Army Air Corps, uh, worked for the Boy Scouts, I think, for five or six years, and later went back into the service in the then U.S. Air Force, and he retired as a general. Uh, Roland uh, was unique. You know, nobody will, will ever be able to do it, but he did. But he was a job, job well done. Uh, I have worn the uniform that you see, which is a little different, because this is the uniform he would be wearing in that period. This is the camp, the first camp patch which he designed. And this is Mecca Chief, which on the back has a map of New England, which was then Region 1, with a Mecca Chief that professionals in Boy Scouting wore at that time. My neckerchief slide was from Shishka Reservation, where he received his 45-day training to become a professional scouter. I still could put some pieces together. <laughs> uh, just to honor him. Uh, the plaque is going to uh, Virginia. I would like, though, to have it received here uh, for uh, Roland, in this place, because there are no living relatives, by one of his Boy Scouts, because he had been a Scoutmaster before he went to the Air Force. So I would like to have Al Hall, one of Roland's Boy Scouts, receive it for him. Back a few years. <laughs> Al himself 
has his name on the wall of faith. sequence but the two of them are here so we'll do it. Um, today we have the honor of having two honorees here, Mr. Tavard and Mr. L. Hall uh, from last year. Am I correct? Or was it before? Last, last year. So congratulations and thank you for coming. Okay, uh, last but certainly not, not least, uh, can we have Dennis uh, Wilkerson up here for Armand Gulat, please? Thank you, Dennis. Others in the association uh, who are a little bit older than I am. I only met Armin Gilmet once or twice when I was very young. Uh, I was probably seven or eight. The, the only time that I met him, he had already retired from being ranger at that point. Uh, and I believe he had come back out to a camporee that I was at to pay a visit while he was in the area. Um, but in the last few years, doing some work recovering the history and recording the history of the council and talking with those who knew him, um, I've really come to respect the man and the kinds of things that he did out here uh, for the council, for the scouts that were out here for over 30 years of scouting. Armand was a longtime volunteer. He got started in the late 1940s and volunteered uh, right through till the end of the 1960s when he became the camp's first permanent resident ranger, first, first ranger to actually live on the property. He and fellow Wall of Famer Fred Prefontaine actually built the ranger's cabin, uh, which I got to live in for a couple of weeks when I was filling in in between ranges 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and one of the things that became very clear as I started to look around camp was that Armin loved to build things and make things. The number of things around this camp that I've stayed in buildings that his, his fingerprints are all over. Uh, the Adirondacks, I've camped in numerous times. Um, I've sat on benches and around conference tables that he built. And there were a large number of permanent fixtures out here that wouldn't have been here without his efforts. Um, I knew some of what he had done as Ranger. Uh, and learning more about that, you know, even, even more respect as I've, as I've learned. But outside of his his role as ranger, there's a few other things that people may or may not know about his involvement. One is that in 1964, when we had the big fire out here, he wasn't the ranger out here at that point, but he was involved with the civil defense in Fairhaven. And he's actually quoted in a lot of the news coverage of the day as uh, one of the people who came out and helped deal with the, the fire and the aftermath of the fire up here at camp. Whether that was uh, a combination of his scouting experience and his involvement with the civil defense, or, or strictly because of his love of the place, is kind of hard to kind of hard to separate the two. The other thing is, when he retired from being ranger here, he went on a trip of a, a, a road trip of the American Southwest. Uh, went out to Philmont, visited a number of scout camps. He and his dog got into the truck drove around for quite a long time, in fact. And when we were getting ready to do the dedication for the, for the Rangers building, um, somebody from one of the councils that he had 
visited on that road trip reached out to talk to us about him. Uh, this was the Double V Scout Ranch. And as it turns out, he was, he was traveling around and just relying on the, you know, the, the unspoken tradition of rangers of being able to stay at whatever scout camp he happened to go into as a, as a fellow ranger. And he actually stayed at the Double V for several months, giving them an enormous amount of help in getting their camp set up from the ground up. Uh, building buildings, help build their pavilion, set up their pub area. And they remembered him well enough that when we were dedicating the building, they reached out to us to give us all of this information so that we knew the kind of man that he was. With all of that, but mostly for his contributions here at Cachalot, both as a volunteer and as its first resident ranger, and for all of the things that he did for the camp and the people who camp here, we welcome Armand onto the Wall of Fame. Built my very first cradle. Just like a cool to uh <laughs> yep. the event, but uh is anyone that would like to say anything about these three individuals that no? No at the time. Well this was a pleasure for me to do. Um, how do you guys like it? Huh? I think it's a great job. It was well well needed.